Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> so, David James, who's in the front row here, uh, is teaching a whole class on brackets at USC, which is really, how's that been going? Are the nice. students into it? Uh, off and on. Off okay. And on. <laughs> well, I, and part of why I asked that is, um, it's, 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 ring I know he's a big name in independent, um, you know, for lack of a better word, experimental film, but it's still so amazing to see so many people want to come out and see these films. So thank you all so much uh, for coming. Um, you know, that there's a, an, an audience uh, of, you know, of all ages and backgrounds uh, here to, to see these. And this is not like a typical greatest hits program of Brackage. Um, the program at UCLA on Friday night, which was really uh, fantastic, uh, nevertheless contained a lot of his uh, more iconic films like um, uh, Moth Light and Anticipation of the Night and Serious Remembered. And, uh, and yet there was still also a pretty large crowd for those too. So, but the fact that you guys are here to see films that maybe, I know Scenes from Under Childhood Section 1 is on the second Criterion DVD, but the others are not available and are not necessarily uh, super well-known works of his. So, um, I, but I think you'll be really pleased with them. I think it's a, a, a nice cross-section of uh, these different uh, approaches. Um, as Adam mentioned, I, I've been working on restoring Stan's films for, uh, I think he said many, wait, a, a number of years or whatever word, <laughs> word he used. It's actually been since um, 2004, which kind of blows my mind when I think about it, because that's way longer uh, uh, that I'm almost comfortable to admit publicly. But um, <laughs> but the the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Film Archive, where I work, is, is the home to the collection. Um, when uh, Stan died in uh, early 2003, I was actually working at Canyon Cinema, which is one of his main distributors. And I had never actually gotten to know him in person, but we would talk on the phone a lot and just for like nuts and bolts, like everyday stuff, like, oh, can you send this here? Or hey, how, how much money in my account? And like all that kind of stuff. But he, he was also really, uh, it was just kind of amazing to get to talk to him because there was something about him. He had this kind of mythic sort of bearing and this, um, and I remember I told him, uh, um, somebody, had, uh, a friend of mine at the time worked at a daycare center and worked with all these little kids. And one little kid in particular kept telling her all these dumb jokes that he made up, which were really funny. And Stan loved dumb, corny jokes. And so I remember I would occasionally tell him jokes that these little kids had come up with or that they had mangled. And, and he always would laugh like crazy at these jokes. And he, because it, it came from children too, it was all the more important, like this kind of um, in, innocent um, joke telling impulse. Uh, this, I, I Idea of, of humor and the, the impulse to entertain and, and make grown-ups laugh and all that. He, he found that really moving and would just laugh this like huge laugh that he had. And so, although I, I can't say I really got to know him that well, it was it, it was maybe um, I think a meaningful early experience to be able to work with him at least a little bit. And then um, find myself at the academy in 2003 where. I learned soon after that his um, all the originals for his films, which I had thought had already gone to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, were in fact still in the possession of Marilyn Brackage, his widow. And so we started talking, and over a, quite a period of time, uh, she agreed, um, in which was a quite a, an honor and a gesture of trust on, on her part, uh, to deposit them at the Academy. And then I, I started working on them in uh, like mid, it was mid-2004. Um, now, for somebody who's over a course of a 51-year career made uh, something like 350 movies, you can't just jump in and immediately know what you're going to work on as an archivist. And so I had to use a combination of what really obviously needed to be restored based on its physical condition and its physical state, its needs. Uh, also, to some degree, the fact that a film is significant historically plays a role, but I try not to let that play an oversized role, because then you would just be restoring a greatest hits of cinema. And so, as I started inspecting all this stuff, which took a couple years anyway, because it's a lot of material, uh, it's just literally physical stuff I had to go through, um, little priorities emerge. Like, okay, this film, the original is lost, and we should make a new duplicate for it. And this film is starting to deteriorate. Or the color is going bad, but it's not quite so bad yet, so we, have, we still have a chance to work on it. Like, decisions like that were made. And, but over this almost 15 years now, um, those priorities have always shifted, and I've worked on something like 65 of his films now, and another maybe 20 that I've just made new prints of and other things. And we're, I'm at a point now where it's a, there's a different aspect to the preservation curatorial approach because there's the whole technical aesthetic side of it and research and whatnot and but then there's this curatorial aspect which is okay what are we preserving and why 
And that's something if we, I don't know if we want to do a Q and A or talk after the screening, and I'd be happy to come up and answer questions if you have them about, about the films, but also about the restoration process. Uh, so I won't go on about it before you just see the films, which is the main reason you're here. Um, but I can say that um, I've reached a point now where it's really, it's a, it seems a little chaotic maybe, like the program itself, even if you look at the years and what kinds of films these are, there's something mildly chaotic about it. Like why these now? Why, why are these the most recent restorations, which, which they are? And in fact, um, except for scenes from under childhood, which is shown in a couple places, um, all the other films, this is the first time the restorations are showing. So I'm also really excited to premiere them in Echo Park, which is one of my favorite places too. Um, but um, again, it kind of comes down to a combination of, of, of need and, um, of significance, so it's these same questions at work, but they're manifesting in different ways because over time, I've worked on more films. Um, there, there have been some interests, like the National Gallery of Art actually helped co-fund the restoration of scenes from under childhood, and so that extra money coming in meant that I could finally work on that film. So it, it, a lot of different weird reasons. Um, as far as the films themselves, I'll just say, uh, Let's see, Scenes from Under Childhood starts the program, and we're gonna watch the sound version of the film, which it was originally made as a sound film and then reissued as a silent film uh, by Stan, but he was interested in letting the sound film uh, continue to exist as a valid version of the, of the film. And so since we have a freshly restored sound version of it, I thought we would show that tonight. Um, and that was uh, uh, the printed very beautifully at Color Lab in, in Maryland. And then we have three films, uh, Shorter ones, uh, that's about 24 minutes, 25 minutes. And then uh, we have Stately Mansions Did Decree, which is a somewhat random uh, late 90s hand-painted film, but it's one that I actually really quite like, and it's, it's kind of exceptional in the midst of these other hand-painted films he made at the time in terms of the uh, optical effects he employed and the color palette he used, and it, it seemed like a nice fit with this program. I've uh, been working on a lot of those hand-painted films lately. And then we have Fire of Waters, which is a pretty unusual and remarkable film from 1965, um, actually made of footage that he had shot many years before and only uh, did anything about uh, and, and edited in the mid-60s. And it's also another sound film, which at that time was quite rare in the mid-60s for him to work in sound. And um, that's uh, black and white, and uh, uh, also done in the Color Lab. Uh, which has been a really great lab to work with for these films. Um, and then we have uh, Self Song and Death Song, which is a really, really unjustly uh, underrated and underknown pair of uh, short films that he made in the, in the midst of his first cancer treatments in 96-97. Some of you who know his work a bit might know Commingled Containers, which is a really gorgeous film from 96 that more famously was made in response to his uh, initial cancer treatments. But this is a little bit later, just a little bit later. And I think it's actually just as interesting and, and quite moving. And uh, I was really happy to work on that and uh, include that in the program tonight. And then we'll finish off with a film of his, which is, I think is actually one of his great masterworks, but which is weirdly underknown, which is Panels for the Walls of Heaven, which is his last major hand-painted film. It's one of his very last hand-painted films, actually. And it's about a half hour long. And it represents a very, very different approach to the hand-painting work than a lot of his previous hand-painted films. And uh, instead of kind of going on and belaboring that, I'll, I'll just say that maybe at the, after the screening, I could, if you want, I could talk a little bit about how over the course of about 30, 40 years of hand painting, he varied his approaches um, based on various factors and maybe why this one I think is quite interesting. So um, yeah, and I'd like to thank the Academy, my employer, for letting us show these prints here. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure. So anyway, that's it. That's is, uh, that so we what we saw just now were five 16 millimeter prints <clears throat> and it's still very very possible as many of you know uh, to shoot on film to you know print on film and just to work with film in general it's gotten more expensive it's gotten a little harder there are fewer labs and fewer options and film stocks and things like that but it's still very possible but for film archives um, less so in the U.S., but outside of the U.S., it's, there's actually a lot of pressure and sometimes not even the opportunity uh, to work in film. But there's a lot of pressure to work digitally, almost exclusively. And for instance, at the Deutsche Kinematek um, in Berlin, uh, they're pretty much, the archivists are not really allowed to preserve films that print on film, including experimental work. And it's, it's kind of, I think it's a huge problem, actually. As long as it's possible, it seems like you should, of course, make the attempt to do that. And in an archival context, restoration 
can be, depending on how you're doing it, quite a bit more expensive on digital than on film, even now. And the fact remains that these works are made on film, and so, I don't know, it's at least my position and my colleagues at the Academy and a lot, number of other archives and individuals that, you know, this stuff should be preserved and seen on, on film. So I, I just wanted to sort of reassert that, if it weren't obvious from the noise of the projector, <laughs> that, um, you know, for work like this, it seems crazy to me the idea that you'd see it in a, a looping, like, HD projection on a gallery wall or, or in, in a theater. You know, there's, some, there's something about um, the medium that gives a, uh, lends a certain presence. Not to mention that it's just the original medium in which the, the work is made. So, um, anyway, that's what I'm Yes? Was, was he painting on one medium and then photographing that on another material that can be projected in process? Yeah. Well, and that's part of why I wanted to, I like the idea of including Stately Mansions to Decree. Panels for the Walls of Heaven was definitely a film that was sort of guaranteed for this program because I, I just finished working on it and was quite eager to, to show it. But it's a very different film than Stately Mansions because in part of the approach to re-photography that was being done. So um, Stan started painting on film right around the turn of the 60s and actually right away quite elaborately. If, you, if those of you that were at the show two nights ago, uh, Sideline Deer Triangular, the birth film, has a, an insane amount of a very sort of expressionist mode like painting all over it. And, um, and then he, his very first purely painted film as far as I've been able to figure out, in other words, that where he's not painting on photographic material, uh, is from around 1975. It's an untitled uh, short film from a, a film, a series of films called Short Films 1975. And then after that, he kind of tentatively made a couple more purely abstract, purely painted films until the 80s when he really started making a lot of them, uh, particularly in the mid 80s. Like you might know films like the Dante Quartet and stuff like that. And it's with these films where he started to realize he could work with his lab, and particularly a guy named Sam Bush, who was the optical printer operator at the lab, to create various re-photography effects. And so first of all, in order to duplicate this painted film onto projectable film material, you uh, you know the, he's painted on the film, and then uh, the lab would have to make uh, an internegative, like a duplicate negative, and which then could be used to make prints that you could project. But in, in this process, you could also make these elements on an optical printer, which is a re-photography device, which enables you to have more control over what you're re-photographing from the source to the target, uh, you know, uh, raw stock. And so that means something as simple as you could just print every frame twice, so you slow it down by 50%, or you know, three times, like things like that. Or you can create fade-ins and fade-outs and dissolves and superimpositions and and you can get pretty elaborate with it. I mean, this is the basis of all, even Hollywood special effects until pretty much the late 90s. Uh, you know, if you have a spaceship against the star background, you'd composite those together with an optical printer. And so um, Sam Bush at Western Cinema Lab, Stan's lab, his lifelong laboratory in Colorado, he was really, I think, a genius uh, optical printer operator. It takes a certain kind of mind, very mathematical, very precise, very, uh, very uh, okay with very repetitive tasks. Um, and, and a talent for abstract thinking, I think, uh, across time and, and uh, in terms of the material. And, and Stan and Sam had a really rich collaboration that involved a lot of phone conversations, a lot of letters, a lot of the development of specific techniques that sometimes Sam would come up with, sometimes Stan would come up with. Um, and for all these films, um, they got in some ways increasingly complex until a language had developed that involved a lot of very elaborate optical effects. So Stately Mansions did decree the beginning and ending sections of that film, which have a very odd color palette, which I really love actually, these odd like pinks and blues and sandy colors, and it's a little bit desaturated. Um, this is the result of um, what's called uh, bypacking, where you take two pieces of film and actually sandwich them together, and then you're shining light through and re-photographing it onto a, a new piece of film. So anything that's clear or more transparent in one layer uh, will let the image through on the other layer. So if you have like a, a big clear area in, in one layer, whatever's behind it will sort of fill in that hole, if that makes sense. So it's just like imagine two pieces of film that would stuff on them that you're shining a light through and what kind of composite image that makes. And so that film has a lot of that. And it also has a really regular rhythm for the whole middle section, which involves um, show, printing every frame once for a section and then printing every frame twice. And it goes back and forth between this normal speed, half speed, normal speed, half speed, and it has a certain regularity to it. 
And that's kind of characteristic of a lot of those films. They're sort of eye-popping and very... And, I, and I'm a big fan of them, don't get me wrong. I, but there's a certain know-how to them in terms of the optical printing that makes them feel different. I mean, they're really expertly realized um, technically. When Sam got laid off from the lab around 99, 2000, Stan had a bit of a crisis. Like, he had developed this way of working over, like, 15 years with this one guy at the lab. And he instead started working with a couple of his uh, students at, uh, well, first with Phil Solomon a little bit, his friend, also a filmmaker. And then with um, his students, but particularly Mary Beth Reed, who was one of Stan's students in the 90s, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, and is really talented and does a lot of optical printing work herself in her own films. And so she worked with Stan to print panels for the walls of heaven, which was done on, a, on an optical printer at the school, which was a much less fancy machine. And so, like, you may have noticed the image is kind of moving a little bit sometimes. It feels a little unstable sometimes. And these are products of the machine itself, but it, it actually lends a certain uh, kind of tense energy, I think, to the piece, like a, a, a vitality, I think. Um, the painted films done at the lab tend to be a lot more like rock steady and really super sharp and really uh, vivid. But the later ones, starting around 2000, tend to be, they, they feel more handmade to me. And Stan, although he's an incredibly technically adept filmmaker, he knew so much about film. He shot without a light meter. He, I mean, he could kind of, he knew how to do it all quite well. He never really operated the optical printer himself. He, he worked with other people who did. But in these last few films, including Panels for the Walls of Heaven, he worked with Mary Beth, and, and she kind of taught him how to use it. And so um, he actually operated the optical printer himself on quite a bit, along with her. And so, as you may have noticed, the rhythms in that film are completely different than Stately Mansions, or different than like most of the films that are on the Brackage DVDs, for instance. Those are like 90s hand-painted films, which have a certain regularity to them, and a, um, a certain, um, like I said again, a certain maybe extreme technical expertise to them, which is sometimes uh, sometimes really expressive, sometimes a little bit distracting, in, in my opinion, at least. So Panels for the Walls of Heaven was, there, there was quite a lot of painted material, like a roll like this big, maybe about, more, longer, I think, in total than the actual length of the film, if I remember correctly. But it was printed in all these different ways with these irregular rhythms that were very much um, Stan working intuitively with the, the, the rhythms. But also it goes between these one-to-one, -one, like really those really rapid sequences like that the, the film ends with, are where he's just directly one, one frame to one frame, like copying the painted film. So it goes by quite rapidly. Interspersed with sequences of different types of optical photography effects that involve the frames dissolving from one to the next or superimposed or yeah, I mean, and, and it's it doesn't really follow a completely regular pattern, and so it's sort of always surprising. I think this film, like you kind of never know what to expect. Whereas some of the other painted films get into sort of a locked system, um, which again I'm not necessarily super critical of, but it, it this one speaks to me more than a lot of the others. I think. So that's a really long partial answer to what you asked, but I hope that sort of explains. So so, but basically, they're bo they're in both cases they're being uh, re-photographed on a color negative. And in some cases, he rephotographed on the Kodachrome, but not not with this one. So, incredible stuff. Yeah. Yes. Oh, while you're going on the, do you mind speaking about the actual paint materials that he used over time, uh, and if yeah. they changed much? Uh, well, I mean, the biggest difference is that the earliest ones are super thick, and then the latest films are like it's really thin, <laughs> and that um, has a lot to do with the materials. So. He, in the last several years, I don't know how many, um, he had discovered these paints that, that he were imported from Iran that were meant for painting on glass. And they went on to film and stayed on it really nicely and adhered and were quite vivid and quite, he could work with them quite um, in a nuanced way. And um, they were non-carcinogenic, I think, because he, he had maintained up till his death that probably this extreme exposure to paint and I mean getting it all over his fingers and all over the place and then he would lay the film out in the hallways of, of school and just like, spray it with this like, sealant like the, the exposure to all these chemicals he thinks is part of what exacerbated maybe uh, the, or caused or exacerbated his cancer and so he switched to these sort of non-toxic paints but like some of the earliest painted films like Thigh Line, They're Triangular or I Myth 
uh, or a really obscure film called Nodes from 1981, um, which is also one of the earliest um, purely painted films. The paint is quite thick on the film. I can't, I'm kind of surprised it went through a film printer. Um, but yeah, he also did like the Magic Marker, and sometimes it's just scratches on leader. If some of you might know uh, Ellipses Number no. Five, um, which is on the Brackish uh, DVD, it was a really great James Tenney piece as a soundtrack. Uh, that's actually scratched um, black, opaque black leader. So he scratched it to reveal uh, like clear, like white forms, and then uh, printed as negative because you're seeing black on a white background in the finished film. So like you, all kinds of different techniques. Yes, sir. The hand, the hand scratch titles that occur in a number of his films. Was he actually, he did that directly onto a little 16 millimeter frame? Yeah. Ah, how? Or, or eight millimeter if you saw 23 Thumb Ranch uh, or, uh, last night. Um, yeah, he, I mean, he would use some kind of a, a scribing tool. And, but here's the crazy part, it's in cursive on top of that. Because he was, uh, he was, you know, I mean, I, I learned cursive when I was growing up, but I was probably the last generation that did. I don't know if people still do. But on top of that, he had to write them backwards because 16 millimeter has a varying emulsion position. The emulsion can be there in relation to the orientation of the image. The film emulsion can be on one side or the other. So uh, A lines or D lines, it's called. And so like, for instance, tonight even, there, um, the scenes from a childhood print was an A wind print and uh, Fire of Waters is a B wind print. It just depends on what generation and how the material is used, like if the emulsion's on one side or the other. But camera original film, like so first generation like or whatever not first generation but like zero generation film out of a camera is automatically b-wind and b-wind so i hope this isn't too dorky and technical but b-wind film if you're looking at the image with the correct orientation like everything is correct left to right and so forth you're actually looking at the base side the plastic side not the emulsion side which means if you want to write a title like that in a, on a B-Wind element, you actually have to write it backwards on the other side of the film so it'll read correctly when it's printed. I hope that makes sense. But essentially, all, almost all of his titles that are hand scratched on his films, he had to hand scratch them that small, but also backwards to get them to be in focus and read correctly. So yeah, I don't know, he's just really good at it. <laughs> I mean, and some of you, I know we're at 23rd Psalm Branch last night. I mean, he has one, I mean, the 8 millimeter frame is a quarter the size of a 16 millimeter frame, not half. I mean, it's a quarter. And he wrote, uh, take back Beethoven's ninth then, he said. Like, it's like that, like that. I think that's on maybe two successive titles, but he wrote, that, he wrote the word Beethoven in, in cursive backwards on an 8 millimeter frame. Which I was thinking about it during the screening list. Good God, how did he do that? But, this is a pure feat of, like he could have gotten a job in like a public park writing names on the grains of rice. Yes. <laughs> uh, so what, did you have any references or notes as far as what these films are supposed to look like when you're restoring them? Yeah, that's a very good question, because it's hard. <laughs> um, yeah, like actually, for instance, believe it or not, as dark a film as Fire of Waters is, I'll confess that this print needs to be a tiny bit darker. Because <laughs> um, there's some little things about it that are not quite supposed to be visible the way they are. It's, yeah. Um, ideally, when on any restoration, I ideally have a reference print or more than one print. That's an existing print that, again, ideally the filmmaker oversaw the making of. And again, ideally, um, does represent their approved uh, you know, version or appearance of, of the film. Stan had a tendency to accept a certain variability of quality in his prints, and his lab had certain periods where they were doing really crappy work, actually. Um, but sometimes they were amazing, and sometimes they were, it was a little inconsistent. For the most part, they were great. Um, they, uh, so some of the prints that are extant are of variable appearance. Like Moth, Moth Light is a famous example where a lot of the prints, you could look at six different prints and they'd all look a little different from each other. Um, he also, in the last several years of his life, I mean, he was constantly making prints. He was very prolific. And on top of that, each film he made, he might make like 15 prints of it just to send all his distributors and to have copies of his own. And he literally just didn't and couldn't look at all those prints himself. So he had to trust that the lab had not screwed up. And sometimes he'd find out later that they had. So for me, starting in 2004, the idea was 
using various pieces of evidence, um, including checking out as many existing prints as possible to determine what the preservation and the restoration should look like. And is there a little bit of guesswork might be the implied question. And the answer is there can't help but be a tiny bit. But in most cases, there's actually a lot of evidence that can support things being made to look in a, in a certain way or, or go, to go in a certain direction. Um, the painted films in some ways are the hardest because they're totally not figurative. And so I'm kind of looking at things like color fidelity, but also at density. Like, is it too dark? Is it too light? Panels for the Walls of Heaven took a really long time because my process for preserving the painted films is I have the original optical negative and I have a print, a reference print that Stan made and put it, can't, usually Kenyan cinema, I borrow the prints from them. And I won't even get into, is it a print that looks like it's supposed to look? I mean, there are, there are ways in which I have to determine that too. Um, but once I have one, uh, then I actually, I give it to, in the case of the painted films, I give it to Photocam, which is a lab here in LA. And they, they make a new print that looks as close as possible to that reference I've given them. And then I take both of the, the reference print and the new print, and I put them in a synchronizer, which is a, a device just for locking two uh, prints in sync with each other. And I just wind through and I literally look at every frame as it goes by and make sure they match. And sometimes it takes six tries to get that right. Like, I worked on Shark series, this really lovely uh, mid-90s film, and that took six tries to get that to look right. And I, and I have to be that picky because he's not around to approve it. And I have these prints that are extant that uh, I'm using as references, and they, they can't help but be definitive at this point. And so I have to treat them that way and make sure that the new prints are just ex as exactly correct as possible in reference. So in the case of Panels for the Walls of Heaven, it took several tries because each sequence, having been printed on different net stocks at different times on the school printer, it's a little inconsistent compared to the ones done at the lab in the 90s because those are done in a more regular, like, focused session, and they, they're pretty more, they're much more consistent beginning to end. But Panels for the Walls of Heaven is assembled for multiple roles and all this stuff. <coughs> so after several tries, and we got the new print that I approved, which is actually the print you saw. So this is a print off the original negative, which is part of what it's so lovely. Um, then we make an interpositive, which is a, a finer quality master positive copy, and then an internegative from that, and then we make a print from that new negative, and then that print has to match the print that I approved. So I again put them in the synchronizer and <laughs> like going through and checking it, like like kind of frame by frame, shot by shot, and it takes a while and I have music playing or I might you know I don't know. Um, yeah, it's usually music. Sometimes John Oliver or something like I don't know, something that's like talking to kind of help you through it. <laughs> and, and then it um, I eventually I reach a point where I feel comfortable for me. Do you train in a successor in case anything happens to you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no. You want the job? I think about that. <laughs> yeah. So I don't. Did that did that answer the uh, question pretty much? Yeah. 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 So did you? So in the case of the ones that were printed, yeah. Uh, you know, like through the optical printer, did you have access to like the original strips that he painted on? I do, but you know, very seldom do they look anything like the finished film. That's the crazy part. It's like so. Um, one like one of many, many, many tricks and ideas, technical approaches that he took in making the painted films was to. To, um, to take the painted strip and actually print it as if it were a negative. So he would res uh, get a print that had uh, opposite colors. So anything that was red would be cyan and you know so forth. And so then he would use that as the source material. So sometimes you'll see one of these, like the like stately mansions did decree those beginning and end sections have some negative colors in them. So it, it looks nothing like the actual painted material. And some of them are really incredibly elaborately composited and woven in and out. Like some of the films are made from a single Mobius strip of painted film that he then instructed the lab to print in a variety of different ways and then that would be composited in a variety of ways and it would look nothing like the original thing. and sometimes it does look a lot like it but most of the time it doesn't so and then in something photographic like fire of waters um i happen to have a couple of really nice uh, late 60s original black and white prints made directly from the original which uh, are identical to each other, which is an important bit of evidence. Like, okay, they look like each other, so probably this is how it's supposed to look. And I've been using those as a reference for that. And Scenes from Under Childhood, part one, I, I happen to luckily have a Kodachrome print, and Kodachrome famously doesn't fade, unless it gets really, really badly deteriorated. But, um, but the color is just absolutely intact, and it's gorgeous, and it, it was just a crucial reference for restoring that film, actually.
Yeah. What, what state are the original negatives in? What state are they in? Yeah. The yeah, and you mean what condition? Not like what state in the union, right? Um, yeah. Uh, they're in California. Yeah. Um, they're a lot of them. Uh, they're a, a lot in a lot better shape overall than they should be. <laughs> Given somebody who made so many films over such a long period of time and did so many unconventional things with the medium and the, and the stocks. Um, there's a really terrible stock called Ectochrome Commercial that was great until around 1970 and Kodak reformulated it. And then uh, from 70 to 83 or so when they discontinued it, it is very archivally unstable. And so um, filmmakers like Chick Strand and Pat O'Neill um, shot on this stuff and, it, and it's just the originals are faded for a lot of the films. Stan actually never liked that stock. And part of that is because it's not a stock that's really designed to look good on a projector. It's meant for, it's a low, low contrast stock that's meant for duplicating. And Stan never made work prints of his films and cut those. He always cut his original directly. And he essentially wanted his prints to look like his originals. And so something that had this like really flat, gross, like low contrast look, that it wasn't, he wasn't interested in that aesthetically to want to use that stock. So as a result, luckily, because he didn't shoot that stuff, um, all of his films from the 70s, uh, for the most part, are in pretty good shape color-wise, because that's kind of the worst thing that can happen with the stuff is the color phase. However, um, there, are, there are some problems, like there's some films that he used that duplicating stock to copy other material. Like he would duplicate stuff and then cut the duplicate into the film, or in the case of Dog Star Man, actually, in uh, the mid 70s, he had an opportunity to make a negative uh, paid for by the Library of Congress for that film to preserve it. And before he did that, he took all of the very heavily painted and manipulated and cut up and appliqued stuff out of the f originals, copied it optically to make like a safe, um, sort of more clean copy of it onto this shitty stock, and then cut that back into the originals of the film. And then they made this internegative. So. That's great and everything. We have this internegative that's 42 years old, which luckily still prints well and looks good. But the actual originals have all this faded junk cut into them now from the 70s. But luckily, he saved all the stuff he took out. It's just like, can I put that jigsaw puzzle back together? I don't know. Um, but but so it's 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 a, a it's a mix though. Bottom line, yeah. It's, um, scenes from Under Childhood. The actual original originals for this film that he actually spliced together because this film went through two iterations of lab printing to get to the final compositive result. It's hyper complex, like just from an editing standpoint. And he originally had these three printing rolls he cut together from almost every stock imaginable, black and white, negative, positive, color, Kodachrome, Ektachrome, Anscochrome, Agfa, et cetera, color print stock, all kind of color negative, everything you can think of, colored leader, like just solid color stuff. And then he, had it woven into this really complex set of dissolves and superpositions, he copied that. And then the copy, he actually edited further into the finished movie. So luckily he did that because that final master set of elements are actually unfaded and they're beautiful. But half of the stuff in the actual cut elements are, are totally faded. And, they can't, and nothing can be done about that archivally. Because um, it's like sometimes two frames at a time of like the baby's face or something like that. So it's like, it's a, yeah. The mix. I could go on. <laughs> I already have. <laughs> yes. Was there anything that really surprised you when going through and archiving this collection? Uh, just like anything, like anecdotally. I don't know. Sort just, of. Or? Uh, with. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. I mean, a bunch of stuff, probably. I mean, one thing overall that surprised me was I, I was somebody who had seen a bunch of Brackage movies because I was just tried to see a lot of stuff. You know, when I worked at Canyon, I would watch things after hours, and just to familiarize myself with what the heck I was doing. Um, and I, li I really liked his work a lot. He's obviously very significant, written about, and all that. But there's an easy tendency to say, yeah, but fuck that guy. You know, Stan Brackage, you know. I mean, there's something monumental about him that makes you want to knock him down a little, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Destroy your idols, but also it's like maybe it's just it was like the punk ass in me in my early 20s. Um, but once I started working on the films and spending a lot more time with them and actually thinking about what he was doing and when and why and all that, and just seeing a lot more of the films, maybe you perhaps a bit more mature person in my mid late 20s, um, I, re I realized that I thought he was actually pretty amazing and a, a quite a visionary artist. Uh, and 
Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of things to criticize about them too, but it's um, it's kind of neither here nor there. I mean, the the films are pretty incredible. In a lot of them. He doesn't have a lot of duds that I've seen. I mean, there's some that are kind of dorky and not that interesting, or, or maybe insubstantial a bit. But he's got a, he's got a huge amount of I think really interesting, significant films. And I think I think honestly, Panels for the Walls of Heaven. I think it's a major work. I mean, I think it should be way more well known. Mm -hmm. Like in just as we know, 20th century or whatever, 21st century American artwork. Yeah. 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 Do you happen to know the, uh, I guess, production length, for lack of a better term, of uh, panels from like first uh, paint to final uh, optical? It's like panels. how long it took? Yeah. Oh, you know, I, I can't say I know really very accurately, but I would guess it's less than a year. Because he, he also worked on multiple things at once. And he would like he would sit in this cafe every day in Boulder and paint while he had like an Irish coffee or something like that. And so it was just so much a natural part of his process that it's not like he went into some trance to then go paint in his little secluded art chamber. I mean he, he kinda did it all over the place while he was hanging out with people talking. It would be very a very social activity in some ways. Um, so he was always working on that. And so, yeah, my guess is that it developed over time, but probably a year or less, I would imagine. Yeah, it's an educated guess. Yes? How, do you, how are you going to choose which films you archive moving forward? You said there's a bit of like, curating involved in yeah. the rest of the collection. Um, I, the, the painted films, like in a way, it's, this is from 2002, this film, so it's a little bit, I mean, it's, you know, it's like, how many years ago is that? 16 years ago. So, but that's not that long ago. And in a way, it might seem strange to prioritize for preservation of film that's only 16 years old. Um, I mean, even uh, Stately Mansions is not quite 20 years old. Uh, but at some point, I realized that a lot of... So, he, I mean, he made dozens of these painted films, and they are almost all finished on colored negative. And the negatives are all in good shape. But in about half of the cases... He had enough funding at the time. He was actually quite concerned about the preservation of his own films. He's one of the few filmmakers that, over many, many years, like really actively worked to try to preserve his own films because he didn't think anybody else would. Um, and so he, when he had the money, would make duplicate master elements for these films. So films like Black Ice and Stellar and Shard series and some of the ones that are on the, on the DVD set, he actually made these interpositives and internegatives himself. And then the original negative would not be used further. And so, but I realized at some point that about half of the painted films, he hadn't done that because he didn't have the money. And so I thought, well, I mean, in a way, this is like actually kind of an easy batch of stuff to work on. I mean, little did I know it would take longer than I thought. Um, but in a way, I could, I could just sort of take like six or eight of them at once and get prints and kind of check everything out and then get them all to the lab and just sort of get this going because they all follow the same process of printing and preservation. And so it seemed like a, a nice way to get some of these protected, but also to have new prints in existence. And, you know, they weren't in dire need, but, but any further printing of them would mean printing these original negatives and anything could happen when you're doing that. So, so it was a way of trying to avoid having to print the original negatives again except for preservation. So, um, but, you know, like I'm actually right now working on his very first film, Interim, which is from 1952, but it's taken me 14 years to get to it. Because, <laughs> um, like, the oldest films are not necessarily the uh, most endangered. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's hard to, I, I'm not exactly sure how to answer because I, I can't say that there's, like, a really reasoned out, clearly explicable process. It, it's kind of intuitive in a lot of ways. Like, uh, like I've been, I've, I've been trying to work on all of his sound. He only has 27 sound films out of 300 some odd movies. And so I've been trying to actually just get all of his sound restored, even if I haven't worked on the picture. Because a lot of his sound elements are kind of unstable because he had a tendency to recycle the magnetic stock, which in the old, some of the older magnetic stocks are on acetate and are particularly unstable, like magnetic film is unstable and on acetate more than um, photographic film is. And so like his sound films from the late 80s, early 90s, the, the magnetic sound masters are actually really in terrible shape. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe I should just start getting all the sound transferred and restored and that, that way it's all done. I don't have to worry about it. So yeah, so I, yeah, it's, it's based on a lot of factors. So I wish I could explain. It's one of those things I can't explain because it's just how my mind works probably. <laughs> yeah. One more, there's one. 
<laughs> what did, I, I'll answer your question, but I'm curious, what did people think of Self Song and Death Song? Is this like a totally unknown movie? I, I don't know, I really like it. Well, the second half, I'm curious because it's from 97, but is that that second, the Death Song half of it, is that um, like older material? Because it was really... Um, All the dirt scratches. Yeah. Which is kind of, despite his reputation and how he worked with the material, he's kind of not known for that. Like foregrounding yeah. deterioration in that way. And apparently it came from this idea of being interested in, in light as he was, but in a light that could also be dirty or, or unwell or polluted. And so he got that roll scratched up and then actually had the lab optically duplicate it and maintain the scratches. So the negative for that film has the scratches actually photographed into it. Um, but that's the kind of thing I sometimes, when I talk to students about film archiving, I'll, I'll tell them, you know, if I gave that film to any of the labs that deal with digital restoration, and just said, okay, just, we, you know, we need to get this restored. I mean, 10 out of 10 of them would digitally erase all the scratches. And yet that's part of the movie. And so, I don't know, that's why, that's like how I justify my role, I guess, is that I gotta be the one that said, no, don't do that. <laughs> um, okay, one. Yeah. Only if no one else has a question. Um, I was wondering if you remembered any of the jokes that made Stan Rutledge laugh. <laughs> 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 um, I'll, I'll, I'll finish by telling the joke, and I'll see what Tom, what you got, and I'll, and I'll finish with the joke. Because that's a good way to end, right? <laughs> I remember the I remember the best one actually too. Yeah. What? You well, you first. Oh. Um, <laughs> no, this should be last. My question. You think so? You should be last. Okay, I'll tell the joke. So, uh, I, the joke that he, he particularly loved this one was, um, what did the snail riding on top of the turtle say? Wee! <laughs> <laughs> and he, like, died laughing at that. <laughs> Can you follow that song? I don't get it. <laughs> Uh, I, I remember he once claimed that he was the only uh, filmmaker, American filmmaker, who could claim that uh, uh, all of his movies had been in continuous distribution since they were originally made, and that all of them had made money. Huh. And I just wonder if you know if that's true. Wow. I know that, I mean, there, like, there are a couple films he pulled out of distribution, although that was a purposeful choice, I guess. <laughs> But I, I mean, I think the distribution consistency thing, I think that's absolutely true. Because not only did he have his own like brackage films concern that used to have a catalog, but he's got 16 millimeter prints in six different distributors. Canyon, Filmmakers Co-op, CFMDC in Toronto, Lycon, Lux, and Mistral in Japan. And uh, as far as whether they've made money, I mean, I don't, that would be harder for me to know, I guess. But I, I'd actually be surprised if, even the most expensive one hasn't by now turned a profit. So he's like the Roger Corman of the avant garde. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the, the consistency of distribution I think is actually really good. Yeah. Thanks, everybody.